I hate thinking about money. I hate quoting on a project. I hate even discussing, you know, anything that has a price tag on it because, you know, ultimately that's what I, I prefer to do is to let someone else handle that and I can just focus on the artsy fartsy stuff. But unfortunately, if you're a freelancer, you are running a business and you are selling a service. So like it or not, you've got to deal with money and budgets, right? Hey Hatchings, welcome to the Motion Hatch Podcast. I'm your host, Hayley Akins. This is part two of my discussion with Lillian Darmono. So if you haven't listened to part one, please go back and do that. That's episode one of the Motion Hatch Podcast. In this episode, we talk a bit about pricing, about whether to set a daily rate or a project fee, about what minimum you should be charging as a rate, We also talk about what questions you need to ask a client before you begin work with them. And we also talk a little bit about her Spectrum series that she did for Motionographer. So please enjoy the episode. So let's go back a bit. You said you're a Motionographer contributor. How did that happen? It's the whole thing started in Sydney when I was working for a company called ZSpace. And I helped make a few TV idents for one of our biggest national broadcasters in Australia called the ABC. And at that time, the ABC commissioned a few different studios to execute these branding spots. And I believed a few were featured on Motionographer, except for the ones that we worked on. So at that time, my creative director was a woman and I was a young female designer who was still quite naive and did not believe that, you know, gender bias existed in our industry. How could we be? Because we were creative people. We're we're better than everyone else, right? We're much more open-minded than everyone else. Anyway, my creative director and my producer, who also happened to be a woman, sort of discussed the fact that the ones that are featured were basically executed by men. And they also looked at the fact that at that time, Motionographer did not have a single female contributor. And so they sort of talked about how the bias might affect the way they look at certain selection, this and that and this and that. And so I decided to write an email to Justin Cohn, who's the founder of Motionographer, and said, hey, you guys don't have any female contributors. And hey, how come out of these branding spots for ABC, the ones that you featured were done by male designers and the post was written by a male contributor because obviously you don't have any female contributors. And to his credit, Justin wrote a really empathetic email reply and said, look, it's definitely not an intentional thing that we exclude women from our featured posts. The post was done by this person because, you know, we encourage our contributors to exercise their personal preference. So obviously he wrote it featuring the spots that he did like, and it's his personal preference. And it did not mean that the work that you guys have done is not great, but it's because we encourage this individual choice and so on and so forth. And as we all know, bias is an unconscious thing and it's In reality, it's a lot more complicated than that, but I will not go into that now because it's just, uh, it's going to open a a huge chapter of discussion that we don't have time for right now. But basically it started out essentially as me pointing out to Justin, you guys don't have any female contributors. And to his credit, instead of getting defensive and upset about it, he took a few on board and I was one of three female contributors that were brought on the following year in 2008. So it was me, Michelle Higa and Lauren Indovina. And really to this day, I am forever thankful for that inclusion because in my work of trying to promote equality and diversity, I can honestly say that that sort of attitude is so precious and so rare, unfortunately, that when you raise an objection or criticism, the person on the other side does not get all huffy and defensive, but instead embrace you and say, 
actually, you are right. We still have a long way to go to being, you know, ideal and we all can learn from each other. And I acknowledge my mistake and in acknowledging of that shortcoming, hey, come on board and be part of our team. So that's how it started. Yeah, I mean, that's really great, you know, and it's incredible to hear that he took on three women and Michelle Higger is obviously amazing as well. And she's know, an it's absolute really, force. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just great, you know, to see, you know, your spectrum series popping up on Motionographer, which is like highlighting, you know, people from different backgrounds that aren't really as fully represented, you know. So I just, I think that is really great. I mean, do you want to talk a bit more about the spectrum interview series that you did? Yeah, basically. I thought about it for a long time and I'm a little bit of a keyboard activist warrior and you know what, it's not going to change a lot. You know, you can get righteous and as worked up as you want. You can rant as much as you want on social media with all your hashtags and your tweets and your this and that. But in the end, it's not going to achieve anything if you confront people, they're just going to dig in deeper to their long held beliefs, no matter how misguided they are. So I feel like the best we can do really is to showcase viewpoints and opinions and individual stories from segments that are not often seen or heard in our industry. So it's, you know, without, I don't want to label it as a diversity or equality series because I feel like often you can turn people off because they know that you're preaching to them and that's not what I want to do. Using words like that can, you know, make you seem, I don't know, better than them or righteous or just a little bit cold, really. So I, I instead of using any sort of words that can be associated with, you know, political correctness, I just want to showcase people's stories because I feel like there's not enough of that going on, especially when you come into any community where there is a predominant group of people of a certain gender and a certain race or a certain socioeconomic background. It can get a little bit navel gazing. It can get a little bit insular. And of course, you know, people don't mean to be prejudiced. People don't mean to be discriminatory but I feel like that's part of the problem is that it's all unconscious that it is human nature to want to stick to people who look like us who are similar to us whether the similarity is in taste in music or fashion or lifestyle or color or gender or sexual preferences it's comforting and it's safe to always be in our own group. So what I'm trying to do with Spectrum is to bring out stories that are unusual, that are different from people that are not often seen or heard in the community, such as people of color, people from lower socioeconomic background, women, and hopefully in the future, you know, more and more international stories that don't come from UK or Europe or America. Because let's face it, you know, there are a lot of very different realities out there when it comes to motion graphic or animation. The clients will be different. The way of executing a project would be different. And I feel that it's not only out of the goodness of our hearts that we need to branch out and get to know people from all kinds of backgrounds, but it is also beneficial because in the end, designers are problem solvers. And the more we are exposed to different ways of thinking and doing, the more likely we will be able to solve problems in a much more interesting and perhaps even more efficient than the ways that we are used to. So that's why the series came about. And I feel that since doing the series, I feel like I'm a lot more focused in terms of my um, my efforts towards trying to give back to the community. So I'm, I'm no longer a keyboard warrior that's ranting at random people getting outraged over this or that injustice. And instead the energy is, is a lot more uh, efficiently focused towards something a bit more positive. And it's such a privilege to be able to talk to all those people on spectrum. And what I find 
to be a bit of a shame is that I have to condense all those interviews into digestible bits, into written articles, because you really get so much more when you're talking to the people themselves. But obviously it needs to be edited down. And a lot of things that these guests say to me can't be repeated. You know, there's a lot of confidential information or things that they're not comfortable sharing with the wider public. And I feel really, really privileged to be trusted enough by these people you know, they, they open up to me and they talk to me and, you know, I, I try my best to, to sort of get as much of that treasure that I get out of every person and share it with the world. But of course there's things that I can't share and that is a shame, but you know, that's, that's a bit of a selfish personal gain that I got out of starting the series, but it's been amazing. It's been, you know, I, I don't know if I would have time to continue it now that I have a child, but you know, I have, good faith that there are other people on board that are willing to continue the interview series down the track and put it up on Motionographer for everybody to enjoy. I think definitely the way, you know, to help this kind of situation where there's kind of a lot of unrepresented people is just, if you are one of those people, just try to be visible and, you know, talk about what you're doing and I didn't realize it was that much of an issue, you know, being a woman in the industry until I had some young interns who were female and they said, oh, we're so happy we met you because we thought that it was like a real like boys club and blah, blah, blah. And I I was really, you know, shocked by that. But Mm. I think, you know, I I just want to be out there and be visible and doing this kind of thing and, you know, doing this podcast, I think will really help and try and get as many people on as possible from different backgrounds to Mm. tell their stories and how they run their businesses and things like that. Yeah. What I find really sad is having been a member of different groups uh, that are women only is how many of those stories that sound so similar are still happening. You know, the other day, just somebody sharing their story on, on the private Facebook group, Pun Animation, that you know, she's a designer and like many of us, she works in predominantly male offices or situations and she feels like she's not being heard, that her ideas are ignored or people talk over her. And you hear these stories over and over and over again. And in a way, it's really reassuring that you're not the only one going through it, but it's very sad that it's still happening even now. I and mean, we've still got a long way to go before things are a little bit more even Steven and, you know, a bit more friendly towards minorities, really. And I guess we we could all be better. Even myself, being a woman, I have been guilty of sexism against my own kind, against women. And it's quite difficult admitting to yourself that you're not perfect. It's very difficult admitting that you're just as biased as everybody else, if not worse. And I just feel like through all these things, the only one thing I could learn is that we should all understand that we could all be better. We have some learning to do. We could all learn from each other and no one is perfectly, you know, exempted from this, you know, flaws, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. I think we'll put the pun animation group in the show notes and also the Spectrum series so everyone can go and have a look at that and um, yeah just go and share it and that kind of helps people see all these different people from different backgrounds and if you're a woman you can join the pun animation group and you know kind of get some advice in there about how to deal with these you know issues. There is another group that I want to share as well called Humorless Mutts Club that is more predominantly illustration based and women who are part of that, I find they are generally that you find more older women there, uh, women from more traditional illustration background that has a very different experience and very different set of tactics when it comes to handling sexism or how to sell their work. Because as you yourself might have experienced, illustrators have this whole different side to their business called rights or managing rights and charging clients for additional amount of money depending on the usage where their artwork would be put up in you know and how long and the territory and all that sort of stuff so i would really personally from the business side of things i would love to see more of that thinking and strategy to be brought into the world of animation and motion graphics 
So if you're a lady or identify with being a woman or female, that is also another great group to join because there's a lot of really good advice in terms of charging people based on where your illustration would end up and how long and who's the client and all that sort of stuff. That is very different than a day rate model. I'll definitely put Humanist Mooks Club in the show notes as well. I was going to ask you about that. When you're doing an animation job, do you generally charge a usage or does it depend on the client? Now that the whole way of charging in terms of usage has been opened up to me, I always ask the client, is my illustration going to appear anywhere else or is it going to be solely used on this animated product? And where is it going to end up? Is it going to be on TV or is it going to be on TV as well as online? How long for and all that sort of stuff. Most of the time, what I find is that the day rate model that we work on in terms of the world of motion graphics and animation, which is roughly what, say about 600 to 650 US dollars a day, that's comparable to maybe about at least 300 to 350 pounds a day here yep. in the UK. That sort of day rate model, when you time step by how many days you work, it's roughly equitable to a usage fee model that traditional illustrators use when it comes to just animation, provided that your client is not going to use your artwork for anything other than the animation. So that's pretty much the same there. But I find that it is always a conversation worth having at the start of every project to ask the client, is this going to appear anywhere else? Because a lot of people don't even think to ask that. A lot of people don't even think to ask if the client wants the final artwork and the working files, which is something we should all learn not to hand over without an additional fee. Because basically, not only it means that the client will never come back to you if they don't want to, to do future series or to do tweaks or amendments to the project if they have the original After Effects files, but also it could potentially mean that you might end up having to do tweaks on your original After Effects files that has then been modified by someone else and saved over many times. So things are just everywhere. The library is all over the place. The timeline is God knows in what kind of mess. And that is extra time. That is extra blood, sweat and tears that needs to be charged for, you know. And I find that it's, it's a little bit scary that not enough of us in the motion graphics industry actually have that clause in their contract, let alone have a contract that stipulates we do not hand over After Effects original project files without X amount of additional fee, or if possible, not at all, which is my advice is actually not to hand over original project files as much as possible. If they insist on it, fine, but they can only have it for X amount of additional fee, whatever it is that you're comfortable charging, you know, um, because yeah, I mean, you know, right. It's, it's absolutely a nightmare to open an After Effects project that's been opened and saved over and modified by three different people. It's just a nightmare. Definitely. I mean, that's one thing, but I think the bigger issue is like you say, if you've done some illustration for a project, even if you're not just an illustrator, you're a motion designer doing something from start to finish if you give over those project files and there's been no discussion about where it's going to be used and um, mm. they could assume that they have the right to use your characters, say in a print ad. And you know, that's like a completely different job. Yep. But I think if you didn't ask those questions, you would never know. And the client wouldn't understand that that was something that they shouldn't be doing. Yep. It's very scary actually to not even have that conversation and to just kind of bend over and let the client have everything. It's, definitely it's something that needs to go you know i i don't care how young you are i don't care how quote unquote inexperienced you are you should never ever hand over what is your intellectual property essentially to a client without prior discussion written agreement and of course a fee you know so yeah i would really like to see the illustration the traditional illustration industry model of charging to come into place everywhere including animation and motion graphics because like you yourself mentioned 
character design is one of those very rare, very precious commodity because it's not an easy thing to make characters that really represent the client's brand. And it is, if, if it's something that's done well, it should and could be designed to work everywhere, especially if they're vector-based because they're infinitely scalable, you know, unlike pixel-based artwork that needs to be done at high res if they want to go into print ad. If everything's vector, you can just keep making them. You can just keep putting them on anything as big as, as a house, you know, or appear on the side of a big skyscraper. That needs to be chargeable. And please, people, have a contract. If your client runs away from it, that should be a warning sign. You know, I know that in, in places that are small, like in Australia or even here in the UK, people are not used to being handed over a contract, but I think it's time, you know, it's come on, it's 2017 and we should all have a contract, whether it's a two day job or a two week job, whoever it is from big to small, if it's all in writing, it will avoid a lot of misunderstanding and pain and ill will later on, you know, and I think we should all have one. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, these conversations are really important to have because I know when I first started out, I didn't think about any of this kind of thing like contracts or, you know, where the artwork was going to be going eventually and things like that. And I guess, you know, we don't want people to have to go through the bad experiences that make them think, oh, I should have said that in the beginning and then we wouldn't be having these issues now with the client and things like that. I think it's like so important and that's you know, what Motion Hatch and this podcast is going to be all about trying to, you know, put these things out there and, you know, making rules for ourselves, making contracts, you know, mm -hmm. having certain ways to work because that's how you can protect yourself. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Another thing that I, I heartily recommend is to read a blog entry by Jessica Hish about the dark arts of pricing. And in it, I think there is a segment that talks about charging by hour versus charging by set projects. And she painted a scenario where if you are charging by the hour or, you know, it's a time-based rate, whether it's a daily rate or hourly rate, whatever it is, you're protected from the project running over, basically. So if the client keeps making changes, then it's not a big deal because you will be paid however long it takes for you to execute the changes, finish the project. But the downside of that is if you are really fast, if you say you have a lot of experience and you can execute the project 10 times as fast as someone with slightly less of a daily rate, then you're at a disadvantage because you are essentially going to be quote unquote punished for being fast. So that's when the idea of charging for a set budget might be a preferable thing to do but obviously the the reverse is true the uh the downside of charging a set fee is that if the project runs over the client ends up being difficult there's a lot of changes that was unforeseen you are not protected from that because you've already agreed on a set rate so in my line of work it's a bit of a, a balancing act of how to charge accordingly whether i should charge a daily rate or should I charge a set fee? Because I'm quite fast. Some of my good clients actually are kind enough to tell me, you are really fast. We are scared of how fast you are. And that's when I know, okay, maybe I should be charging more. But, you know, things like this gives me the confidence to say to a new client who doesn't know me, who said, oh, your day rate is really high. We're really looking for someone with half that. It gives me the confidence to then say, Yes, but I'm five times as fast as somebody that would charge that rate, you know. So tell me how much you have in mind. Tell me what is in your budget. Tell me what you want. And then I can tell you whether I can deliver it or not. And we can negotiate from there. So that's when I would prefer a fixed rate rather than a daily rate in that sort of situation where I'm trying to convince the client that what they have in mind is really doable when they hire me that I'm not that expensive when it comes to hiring a talent because in the end I can execute the job twice as fast or 10 times as fast or whatever 
But in other situations where I'm playing by the unknown here because I have never worked with an, this client before, say there's a new client and it sounds like a process where my artwork needs to be approved by a committee, meaning more than two people, and it's just a big project and I have this feeling in my gut that, oh dear, this is going to turn into one of those, you know, final, 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 final version seven, <laughs> you know, that's when... I start to think, okay, maybe we should negotiate uh, an hourly base or like a time-based rate rather than a set budget. But it's it's a tricky one. But I really recommend everyone to look up this blog post by Jessica Hish, who is a lettering and type designer. And she has written a really interesting long post about pricing your artwork and valuing yourself and how you should charge. And that's a very interesting component in there about daily rate versus fixed fee. We'll definitely stick that in the show notes as well. I think that's really interesting because people generally stick to the day rate model in animation. But I know obviously if you have a project rate, then maybe that gives you a bit more freedom, you know, because especially if you work remotely, your client's not expecting you to be sitting at your desk like on this certain amount of days, you know, you can kind of be a bit more in charge of that. But then obviously with that comes you know, you need to have a scope of work so that you know if if you are going over what you said you would do, then, you know, you can point that out to them on that and you need to have a budget and, you know, how much they're sort of getting for that price. Whereas if you have a day rate, you know, it's easy to say, okay, yeah, I worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on it, so you can pay me for that. So I think, yeah, it's interesting to know that you kind of do a bit of both depending on how you feel it's going to work with the client. I think that's quite good advice to people really because you know it depends on whether how they're used to working as well and what's going to work out best for you and obviously if you're doing a project rate you could work it out on the basis of what you'd normally charge per day but then you're not kind of limited to you know sitting at your desk those days and maybe then if you're working remotely you can have other projects going on and when they're waiting waiting for feedback and stuff like that I mean now that I'm a parent uh, and myself and my husband both juggling family responsibilities for our young son as well as work, the more I believe in the fact that our entire industry, all industries for that matter, because this is 2017, everyone should move to a result-based economy rather than a time face-to-face based economy where people are required to turn up in person where supervisors and managers and clients and whoever it is that we report to or we work for are terrified of letting people work remotely off-site or having flexible hours because they're terrified that we're charging them for minutes and hours that we don't spend working. You know, we're charging them for the time we spend watching kitten videos on YouTube, which is absolutely ridiculous because if you're a freelancer, your reputation absolutely is the most important thing you have in order to, you know, guarantee your future business. So I find it quite a backward idea that studios or managers or hirers or clients are terrified of letting us off their site, thinking that we're charging them money on hours that we don't spend on their project, you know. However, having said that, I completely understand why some people will refuse, absolutely refuse to have talent working off-site because I find that more so than the trust, it is the communication problem that it is quite difficult to communicate certain things well when the person is not in the same room as you, especially when it's a big project and there's many, many people working on it where everyone essentially needs to be in the same room for things to be efficient. You know, I understand that. But I just find that it's time that we move to a result-based economy because no matter what, it's the result that matters. It doesn't matter if your freelancer is working for you on the desk in front of you between 9.30 to 6.30 or if that person is working, say, 8 a.m. till noon and then again between 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. because they have a young child that they need to pick up off daycare or school or, or whatever it is, you know. I feel like it's the next level, the next step up from the discussion whether you should charge day rate or fixed fee is this result-based economy, which is something that we should all get into. Also on that note, there is a fantastic video 
by Chris Doe of Blind, where he is explaining the value of charging based on the value of what you provide rather than a day rate or even a set budget. I will not repeat it here because it's much better if you just watch it yourself. And once you've seen it, it's really interesting because it's a lot closer to that result-based economy that eventually what you want is charging people based on what you can provide to them. And no matter how long it takes and no matter whether you are in person working in front of that person or you're working remotely elsewhere from home or from your own studio with your own equipment. So in the end, you should really be thinking, what am I worth to my client? Obviously, we're all bound by industry standards. We're all bound by market rates and we can't really charge 20 times what our colleague or our contemporaries are charging. But if if everyone just starts thinking in terms of that rather than what is my day rate or what is not my day rate, then I feel like everyone will be in a much better place and we could have a much healthier lifestyle, really, that sort of balances work with leisure and family time. And not everyone would have to kill themselves working crazy hours just to make ends meet. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think it's um, really important to think about, you know, how our futures are going to work. And like you say, you have a child. So how does that fit in with your work? And you obviously have to adjust that. And our clients should understand that, you know, as well and try and working more in that way where you're working like remotely and on a project basis obviously if like you say if you are fast you're not going to be punished for your time Mm. like you know going fast because you end up getting you know paid less you're going to do the best job you can the the quickest you can Mm. and get that to them you know if you know you're going to get this project right so I think that's really great and we'll definitely put Chris's video in the show notes and everything as well so everyone can look at that I think it's really really important to talk about these things and I think the future of our industry especially and probably a lot of industries is going to be more remote because with you know Skype and everything everything is becoming easier to communicate over the internet and you know the internet's getting faster so you don't need to be sat in someone's office Mm. it is more about building trust with your client to you know, allow them to give you the freedom to work remotely. I think that's, you know, really important thing to do, especially if you want to, you know, work and be a parent and stuff as well. And, you know, have more freedom in your life to spend with your family or if you want to do more traveling or, you know, all of those things. It's just the opportunities kind of open up, I think, if you can work remotely. But I think in the beginning, especially with some clients, maybe you need to build up that trust first and then move to more remote setup yeah absolutely so have you got any more tips or anything else you want to share with the audience yeah while i'm here maybe we'll talk a little bit about negotiation which is that's something that a lot of people don't seem to want to know and especially you know for fellow female listeners out there i know it's really a daunting topic to have to negotiate money A lot of creatives also don't really want to think about money. I hate thinking about money. I hate quoting on a project. I hate even discussing, you know, anything that has a price tag on it because, you know, ultimately that's what I I prefer to do is to let someone else handle that and I can just focus on the artsy fartsy stuff. But unfortunately, if you're a freelancer, you are running a business and you are selling a service. So like it or not, you got to deal with money and budgets, right? So The classic advice is very true. You need to start high because once you name your price, there is no way you can go any higher than that because the client is already aware that you're happy to do the work for, you know, say $20 or 20 pounds. Why would they want to pay you more, right? That's ridiculous. So always, 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 always start high. And sadly, a lot of women... I know, like myself, I know this because I am one. It's very uncomfortable for us to go high because it's just so risky. You know, what if we scare people off? We have been raised to not be a bother. We have been raised to be pleasant. We have been raised to be polite and helpful and accommodating. And bidding high just goes against that, completely flies in the face of that. But 
when it comes to business, you really have to put sentiments aside and go hard math, hard, cold cash and think, okay, you got to start high because otherwise the client will not pay you more than the price you've already named as your minimum. So start high and let them lowball you. Again, Jessica Hish has an excellent advice on that in which she said that if the client or the producer that wants to hire you on the job comes back with, great, you know, we'll start you straight away. You probably could go a little bit higher. And if they come back to you, try and negotiate you down a little bit, then you're probably right on the money, right on the mark. And if they say too expensive, then, you know, obviously you're too expensive. Having said that, though, it really depends on where you are. It really depends on the market. So it really pays to know what the acceptable market rate is. And one of the things that I find ridiculous about London, apparently, is that the freelance rate at one point was 250 pounds and it hasn't changed for the last 10 years. And that's just crazy to me because the price of bread increases, right? Price of a pint of milk increases. Rent, goodness knows, increases. And the, the cost of your Oyster card increases crazily from year to year. So why are we not bending together and making sure we can charge higher, you know? Um, and again, in the past, I have been part of many conversations about the advantage of unionizing and why don't we unionize just like VFX workers and other workers in other industries. And it's going to make so much sense to unionize so we can set minimum rates and minimum terms of working, uh, you know, working conditions. But unlike other industries, the product is not uh, homogenous. The product is you as an artist and you as an artist is very different than the next freelancer that comes along. So, you know, in, in a market where the product is not uniformizable, if that's even a word, that there's highly varied talents out there and highly varied uh, requirements for the project, it's very difficult to set a standard rate. But I find that a minimum rate should be at least something that we all strive for, that we need to stick together and not underbid, you know. And whatever that minimum is, is again, it, it really relies on what your talent is and what your bracket is, you know, whether you're a 3D artist or whether you are a generalist motion designer that basically knows uh, Adobe Creative Suite and Cinema 4D, or whether you're an illustrator and whether you're working for an ad agency or you're working straight to a publisher, it all varies hugely. But my advice is to find out what the minimum going rate is and not go lower than that. And if possible, tell each other and be open to one another about how much you charge so that we together, we can make a unified front and try and push the bar to go higher and higher, at least in line with inflation rate. That would be my, uh, my parting advice really when it comes to nitty gritty and pounds, dollars and cents. I think that's great. I mean, I definitely want to talk more about money and things like that on this podcast because I think it can be quite cloak and dagger sometimes and people are scared you know people are scared to share like how much they charge and things like this and mm. because um, it is very dependent per project as well so you know you don't kind of want to put it out there too much because then maybe like for a different project you need to charge more because you're doing slightly different stuff and then obviously it's really location based as well yeah but I think that advice that you gave is really, really great and really solid. And, you know, obviously we'll try and shed light on these things as much as possible. But I think the unionizing thing is very, very interesting. And, you know, I'd like to see something like that or like a standard minimum rate, no matter where you are. I mean, that would be fantastic. But I think it's very hard for people just coming out of uni especially if they're going to try and freelance straight away and things like that and they don't know anyone. I mean, you know, they don't know where to go and how to get this information. So hopefully on the podcast and the Motion Hatch website, we can try and have these conversations opened yeah. up a bit more. Well, let's just lay it out there. I'm willing to say this. Uh, having been on the hiring side of things and having been someone who tries to get hired, so I've been both sides of the fence, it's 2017. Can we try not to charge less than 300 pounds a day plus fat? You know, that will be a good benchmark. I don't care if you're based outside of London. 
I don't care if you again, this is this is a global economy now and people are working remotely from all over the place, right? Can we just try yeah. not to charge lower than 300 pounds a day? And if you are listening from the US, can we try not to do lower than 550? That would be the going rate that I have gleaned from talking to different people from, you know, various social media or, you know, the Slack group of motion designers and and whatnot. If you're straight out of uni, okay, maybe, you know, you're, if you're not confident in your abilities, maybe take that down a little bit, maybe buy 50 bucks a day. Another thing that's important is to specify how many hours are included in that day, right? Because I've heard of crazy stories of producers trying to exploit fresh outcomers from universities because they failed to specify how many hours that is. And they try to load up as much work as possible per day to these unsuspecting new talent. And, you know, you end up working 12 hours a day for the same rate. And that is not acceptable. So the day rate that I have put out there is basically for a standard eight hour day. I don't think anyone should be working harder than eight hours a day, really, because after that, you just tank your productivity goes down because you're tired. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've heard, you know, a lot of people say they charge a day rate for like 10 hours, but realistically, you know, most people are working eight hours. So I think it'd be good to try and aim to specify that amount of time. And I think the rates that you've said, from my knowledge of the industry is, you know, they're quite solid. So I would also encourage that. Yeah. I guess if you, if you have any other sort of info regarding salaries or surveys, I mean, we did a motion design salary survey a while ago, but the data we collected is just crazy. And there's just a lot of work. So now it's about two, three years old and no one has had any time to process it and present it as a easily digestible information, unfortunately. But if we have any volunteers out there to take that data and sort of display it in a in a easy to access manner do get in touch uh Haley, you can link to my email address and i will put you in touch with the people who have that data because that survey was done yeah a good two three years ago and it will be a waste to not display that publicly somewhere yeah definitely so if the audience wants to contact you or find your work where should they go my folio site is www.liliandarmono.com, L-I-L-I-A-N-D-A-R-M-O-N-O.com. I guess you, you have it on the show notes as well. And my email address would be on the about page on that site. Yeah, we'll put everything in the show notes. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Lillian. That was really great. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I think you said some fantastic stuff and, you know, hopefully... That's helped a few people out there. Awesome. Glad to be your help. Thank you for having me. That was so great. Thanks so much to Lillian for coming on the show again. Now, if you could just do me a massive favor and go over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review and also subscribe to the podcast, that really helps get the podcast out there to other people. Also, if you would like, you can go and find more information about Motion Hatch at motionhatch.com and you can sign up for our newsletter. And if you do that, I'll add you to our free Facebook community where we're having more discussions about the business side of motion design and animation. Thanks. See you soon.